I'm super excited to have uh, the one and only Kyung Han Cho uh, visiting us here today. Um, he's a professor at the New York University and also a senior research director at Prescient Design, which was originally his uh, startup company working on uh, medical AI, uh, but now part of the Genetech uh, research. Uh, yeah, and he's also a CIFA fellow uh, among other things, and um, in his own words, actually, uh, at the end of his bio, he says he tries his best to find a balance among machine learning, NLP, and life, and almost always fails to do so. Um, and you know what? Um, he does do a lot of things a bit too much in parallel. So, like, for example, he did the program chairing for iClear and the new rips and ICML, all one after right, uh, the other. And these are really major big conferences in ML. So I don't know how he survived through all of this, but he's giving too much. So, you know, the thing about Kyung Han is that somehow everybody really talks highly of him behind his back. <laughs> so wherever I go, he, everybody's just like raving about him. He's like super down to earth. And then at conferences, he's always surrounded by such cloud of people and students wanting to talk to him. So I never really get to see him this close uh, very often. But anyway, yeah, I'm super excited that he's here. Um, and uh, today he's going to talk about uh, beyond the test accuracy uh, for studying deep neural networks. Oh, by the way, like he's really like among the early starters of the deep learning, especially in NLP field when nobody was really buying into deep learning. He was really uh, at the forefront of it and doing crazy things like you know character-based language models and also among the only few who did attention mechanisms, which of course is like super big now. But anyway, without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the very generous introduction. So yes, uh, I'm spending actually my time you know, at the, between NYU and Genentech, half and half. So in fact, you know, at the, I could have actually talked about you know, at the, the platform that we have built that is called the Lab in the Loop Antibody Design Platform that combines actually you know, at, the, at least three different type paradigms of the machine learning into one loop together with the experimental platform so as to design a new antibodies. And it's going actually pretty well, so I could have talked about, uh, talked about it. But then I just realized that, in fact, the UW is very famous for the protein design. So there is a David Baker, and then you had his gigantic lab that may be actually bigger than the Prussian design team itself. So I thought, OK, maybe not here. And then I was like, OK, so maybe you know, the one thing I can talk about is how these language models may be uh, beneficial for, the, for improving the healthcare overall, which is, after all, all about the constraint resource optimization pro uh, problem based on what we have done at the NYU Langone Health, that is the medical school associated uh, hospital. But then you know, at the, we did a pretty, I think the exciting work about it, but it took us a long time to prepare all the data, that is all the clinical notes from the EHR at NYU and Langone, and then training these models, getting the, mod, uh, you know, at the GPUs and so on, to the point that the, by the time we published it, which was uh, June last year, these models suddenly started to look so small and then we are now training, a, based on this kind of proof of concept, we are training a larger model on a larger amount of the data. So perhaps if Yejin invites me over again in seven years, because the last time I was here was a seven years ago, if I recall correctly, then I'll be able to tell you about the healthcare then. Instead, I thought, okay, what are the kind of, let's say, more kind of, let's say, small things that I spend more time thinking about these days? And then this go all the way back to 2015. Uh, when Leon Boutou, who is now a Meta AI Research, gave a keynote talk, if I recall correctly, at ICML. And then there, you know, Leon pointed out what, what was the main driver behind the success of the machine learning until that point. And then the, what he pointed out was that the, we, were, we had been extremely lucky. That is that the, we were able to rely on this single experimental paradigm that is called a less testy progress on the held out test examples over and over for about three decades to get to that point. And then that's really great. And then, that was, and then that's exactly what we still do somehow. Leon pointed out 2015. 
as the limiting factor of you know, what we can do with the machine learning. We still do that, right? Nowadays, actually, to be strict, we're not even doing that one because we look at the test set over and over. We look at the tested accuracy over and over. And then we only publish when the tested accuracy is higher. So in fact, somehow we regressed since then. But that's never happened before. That's true. That's, you know, few people may have done so. Nowadays, no, none. So there's some difference there. Now, the interesting thing is that the, uh, the reason why I brought up Leon Boutou's talk from 2015 now is that the, the whole machine learning community has this tendency that the, whatever Leon said about 5 to 20 years ago, we always revisit and then try that again. So Leon Boutou talked about the you know, stochastic gradient descent and then you know, the, how it's actually theoretical, you know, the all sound and whatnot, and uh, has a nice, uh, technical report from the 1997. But of course, if we had to wait until, let's say, 2011 or 12, or even now, to realize that the really stochastic gradient descent was all we needed in order to train these kind of large-scale models. So I thought, OK, let's go back to what Leon said. And then you had the, what did he mean by that? So nowadays, if you're saying that, the, well, I'm working on machine learning, what you do is that you're going to collect data. Often, you don't actually collect data yourself. Somebody else is going to collect the data for you. And then you take it as the kind of a say ground truth of everything, and then you take the some part of the training da uh, data as a training set in order to train a model. We call it the process learning, and then we're going to often just do the optimization. And then once we have found the solution under the training set, we're going to run some kind of another set of the optimization problems to solve the problem of let's say getting the labels or the output. Good, and then we evaluate the output, com uh, compare it against the ground truth on a held out sets so as to see how well this model is doing. And then one thing that is a bit you know, simplistic here is that we really focus a lot on evaluation, the final, the test set accuracy, or the test set loss. However, if you think about what, what goes on in between all these steps, there are actually a lot of things that we do that we kind of say, you know, like they assume that they are just all done perfectly. So nowadays, of course, the model construction that is between data collection and learning it's really simple, right? You know, just a transformer, literally just transformer, and then that's it. And then you have the learning is optimization, and then we need to do the hyperparameter tuning. But nowadays, you open the paper and then you read it. What you see is that the so here's a new loss function, here's something, here's a problem, and then you go to the experiment and it says that the optimization done. Here's results. But you know, if you think about it, where do we put most of our efforts on optimization? Where do we put most of our money on? Optimization. So somehow that's actually uh, ignored. And furthermore, in fact, the inference side is also optimization. Until, re you know, if you're just solving a very simple classification problem where the output has a very small number of the possible classes, and then we want to score each and one, one of them and then choose one, that's fine. But now, what do we do? We are working on all this free form, let's say, uh, question answering. Answers can be whatever. And then we want, some people claim to actually use these language models to produce a full textbook. So the space is gigantic. In fact, the space of the output is way greater than the space of the input often. Then you have to, we have to solve some kind of optimization problem. But of course, we can't do it. So we have to be very, very approximate. And unfortunately, this one is also being hidden under the papers. Because they all say that the, we generate from GPT-4. But how? What did you do? No one really knows. Mm -hmm. So today, I'm thinking about covering the three aspects of these things. One is that the, and I'm going to go the other way around, because the thing is that I think that most of the people are more interested in the first, the last one. And then they get less and less interested in as I can come closer to the data collection side. So first, I'm going to talk a bit about the little bit that we have found about the language model. But of course, we are in University of Washington with the, one of the greatest NLP groups in the world. So I probably don't have to spend too much time on that. And the second part is going to be about what it means for the optimization to happen. And then what does optimization actually tell us? And then the final part is going to be more about the modeling assumption. That's the part that excites me most. But that's the part that least excites my students, unfortunately. So anyways, let's start from the first part. And then this was the work that was led by and done by Angie Chen, who is the uh, PhD student at NYU. And then she's going to graduate soon. So if you're looking for some amazing postdocs or the faculty members or just employees, uh, do keep her in your mind. And then this work was just, uh, just accepted and uh, republished at the TMRO. So let's just talk about the inference and language model. Let's say somebody trained it for you. 
Now, this is one of those very few places, Seattle, where a lot of groups, including the, uh, the AI2, Amazon, and so on, are training their own language models. But if you look at the all over the world, there aren't too many of them. So we're going to assume that somebody trained it for us already. So then what actually happens is that the, many of the questions that we ask these language models is very ambiguous. And these models are so good to the point that it's going to put a high probability on all those plausible answers. So at the end of the day, unless our goal is to just you know, leave it to the chance, what we're going to do is that we're going to ask the language model to give me one answer. And then the way in which language model chooses one is to solving this argmax problem over the internal state that is a z, let's say latent variable, and then output as well. So we're going to ask it, okay, give me one answer, and then how the language model finds that answer is to figure out what is one of the plausible answers. And then this allows us to inspect the internal reasoning process of these language models. Let's not get bogged down on the definition of the word reasoning. I mean, I'm going to talk about that a bit. And then you know, one of the examples is a chain of thought generation from 2022. And then the thing that actually has been really like the, both ridiculed, but also have been considered as one of the st standard approach to make language models spit out the right answer. And then the idea is to really ask it to think step by step and then spit out what those steps are together. And then in these steps of the reasoning that language model take can be thought of as this inference on the internal variable z. And then given that one, it's going to give us a one answer. So then, of course, the question is whether this z really corresponds to how reasoning happens. So this is using a text of Vinci 03. I created this example two months ago. I'm pretty sure it's already been fixed. And I was too cheap back then, so I wasn't using GPT-4, so it's not the greatest example. But one example you can see here is that the, well, this, let's think step by step works pretty well. So on the left panel, it's correct for the correct reason. On the right panel, it's incorrect, but the reasoning is also consistent with this incorrect answer in a sense that they made a mistake, but you know, it's a plausible mistake. However, is it really true? If you just continue on very easily, this is not even you know, the, a lot of trials, there's a couple of tries, then what you see is that the sometimes it's going to be correct. The answer is going to be correct, but for an incorrect reason. Sometimes the answer is incorrect, but the reasoning is also incorrect and is inconsistent. And then sometimes it's incorrect answer with the correct reasoning, but somehow language model decided that, okay, I don't really care. I thought that was the, this is the right way to think about, but the answer should be something incorrect. And then these kind of examples are very easy to create, even with the GPT-4 or the latest models that you find. Now then, you know, of course, we want, uh, you know, this is not science, right? It's an anecdotal example. We just tried it out. You know, we can't really uh, believe this too much. But of course, uh, quite a lot of people have been looking into see really, like, does this chain of thought or the, now, now we have a tree of thoughts, forest of thoughts, so many different versions, are they actually the processes of reasoning? And then, for instance, in this paper in Lanham, uh, by Lan Hamel oh, last year, asking, uh, after generating all those chain of thoughts, trying to ask a question, what happens if we edit it? If we edit it, would the answer change correspondingly? If we provide an uninformative chain of thought, would that actually impact the performance and all those questions? And in fact, you can be even more in the, uh, detailed by checking whether the proof is correct by asking language model to give the proof as a chain of thoughts. And then this is a work from the NYU last year, Saparov et al. And then what they did was that they created a bunch of synthetic examples and then where the, it's, in, it's possible to check the correctness of the proof very easily, computationally. And then ask the language model, okay, here are the hypotheses, or I'm sorry, here are the axioms. Now prove by arriving at this statement and step by step give all the proofs. And then it's going to give all those proof steps. And then sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's incorrect, of course. But the nice thing is that you now we can check the correctness of the proof. And thereby, we can check whether for this particular, let's say, deductive reasoning task, these language models, in fact, do follow the reasoning that we would expect it to follow. As you can already imagine, the answer is no. Uh, and then what they found was that the, in particular, these language models are going to be, oh, it was a few shot, let's say, uh, in context learning setup. These mo uh, language models work really, really well, mostly if the statements that it was asked to prove look really, really similar to the examples that were given. But as soon as, the, for instance, the length of the statement grows, number of the axioms changes, or if the necessary steps for the proof changes, then these language models would degrade quite rapidly. And what we get from here is that the if 
it were true reasoning, whatever that means, but according to our sense of what reasoning is, we would expect better generalization because the deductive uh, proof here shouldn't really matter whether the number of the steps is longer, shorter, statement being longer or shorter. So what it tells us is, okay, this kind of inspection reveals that language models don't reason like we do, but then how do we actually check that? So one way in, my, in our opinion to check at, uh, in my group is that, okay, we need to look at really that minimal set. What is the minimal consistencies that we, expect, we would expect if a language model was truly a reasoning agent like we want them to? So in this work, what we did was that we defined a very small, tiny bit of the consist types of the consistency that we tested and then we want the language model to have. And then before I told you about it, there are two definitions that I want to tell you. It's very loose. Unfortunate thing about natural language, well, okay, natural language is amazing. However, natural language has an issue because there are so much ambiguity as well as the redundancy, which means that it's really difficult for us to Make, have a crisp definition and a crisp check often. But we're going to define two very loose notions. Uh, one is semantic equivalence. If two texts, given a context, are semantically equivalent, we are going to say that they are semantically equivalent. How do we tell they are semantically equivalent? We're going to read them. And then second is the replacement. That is that the, uh, if there is a marker, and then if you are going to plug it in, that's going to be a replace replacement. But of course, replacement cannot work directly. We gotta make some changes to the underlying original template as well as the input, but we're going to say that we know how to do that. How are we going to do that? We're going to do it ourselves. So, you know, of course, we are not the first ones. You know, the checking this kind of minimal consistency has been a thing that uh, ever since uh, already from the 2020 or so. So, for instance, this was a, still a masked language modeling uh, era, but then you had know, the Elaza et al. Uh, proposed something called a self consistency. If the questions, two questions were semantically equivalent. The answers by the language models to two questions should be also semantically equivalent. It's pretty obvious in our mind, but it turned out that it's not obvious in language models' minds. So on the right panel is the one that I also tried myself, GPT, I think this one, yeah, Turbo Instruct, you know, at the 0914. It's really straightforward, but it just gets it incorrect. So it really doesn't have the sense that, okay, questions were semantically equivalent. They're like exactly the same thing, but the answers differ from each other. Another example from last year, more recently, is the Berlin L. Uh, what they show was, I, I called it equivalence consistency because they called it like, what was it, reverse curse. I'm not even sure what that means. Here, it's a bit confusing. So if is, the word is, was used to indicate that the subject and the, you know, the object were equivalent, because is doesn't necessarily mean that one, then, then you know, the, when we replace one of them, then the others should stay same. And then it turned out that you know, the, uh, even the latest GPT-4 in this particular case back then did not actually show a high degree of the equivalence consistency. So what are two other things that we can imagine? One of them we tried was a hypothetical consistency and then the other is the positional consistency, which are really straightforward. And I like the hypothetical consistency more, so I'm going to talk about that one. The idea of the hypothetical consistency is really straightforward. Now, if I ask you a question A, and then you told me something, and I'm going to ask you, what would have, what, how, how would you have answered this question A? Then, the answer you give me has to be semantically equivalent to the original question. Right, you're, you're all thinking about it, right? I, but this is correct, actually, so this is okay. So something like, let's say you had the, oh, what did you have as a breakfast this morning? You answer that, I don't know, like the egg. And then I'm going to ask you, how would you answer my question, what did you have as a breakfast in the morning? You should tell me your eggs. All right, okay, this one makes sense, yes. And then this is actually interesting not only because of this hypothetical transformation or the hypothetical consistency, this also tells us whether, check whether this language model will actually know about itself, right? Can it actually simulate its own, let's say, question answering and then take the answer out and then give it out? And it turned out that, the, you know, if you're working with the text DaVinci 003, sometimes that's true. So this is a correct example. But again, very easily, sometimes it's incorrect, incorrect. So if I ask the same question twice, but once by asking the language model to give me the answer to this question that you could have actually, you would have given, then these two answers 
differ from each other. Now, the important thing here is that the, it's about consistency. It's not about correctness. Well, okay, language model can, of course, get all those questions incorrect. That's fine. That's what we do as well. But we want it to be incorrect in a way that is consistent with how we could be incorrect. That is, that the, it's going to be consistent if it was asked the question in a slightly different way. Checking this is not trivial at all, as you can imagine, because we got to create all those things, check, the, check them. So what we did was that we prepared a set of what we call hypothetical transformation prompt template. And then what we did was to tr uh, ask a bunch of different language models the same question to get different answers. These language models really don't agree with each other that often, so it was easy to make them. And then we turned it into a multiple choice question. So out of all these questions, which would have been your answer to this given question. And then if this model actually knows about itself and then knows how it would have answered the question, it would have chosen the right one out of five of them. Well, we tried the five, so one of them is the original correct answer as well. And then it turned out that these language models actually don't do too well. So bigger model, there is a text DaVinci 03 in this case, we tried with the GPT-4 as well, it's slightly higher. But can choose pick out its own answer better than the, all the other language models, which couldn't pick it out its own answer at all at the chance of chance level of the 20%, but it's still pretty low. On the Wikipedia case, it's like 25%. So it really doesn't know what kind of answer it would have given. And then what that also tells us that these language models do not model their own reasoning process and cannot really simulate themselves internally as well. So this really tells us that it's a really simple question, right? If you think about it. It's like the identity operation there. If we say that, the, oh, I made a calculator that doesn't solve the identity, we're pretty much doomed, right? Yes, Anna. So among the choices that you added there, did you also include the correct choice? Or yes. So the, here, so in this particular example, A is, was from the Babish 01, whatever that means. But, and the second one was the original one. Yes, the correct one. There's Ada, Curie, Da Vinci. And then we actually did filter out the cases where more than two of them were exactly the same. Yes. So then when you say they couldn't predict their original response, mm -hmm. in the case that the original response was not the correct one, in what percentage they actually predicted the correct one? Because that's oh, the yeah, yes. right, right, right. So what you're saying is that the do we also need to look at the accuracy as well, right? So that should be the baseline, right? Yes. So the we only looked at the ones that the, so the issue is that the, it's a, all the multiple words, answers. So what that means is that the, every time we generate the answers were a bit different. So that made it a bit difficult, but we chose it so that the, we get a stable, out, we only chose the ones that we get a stable output. And then also that output was somewhat unique among all those models. And original. So this, it turned out that it doesn't know about the identity function. So how about the compositional consistency? This one is even straightforward, and then we tried it really, really easily. The idea is that the, if you know how to answer, uh, if your answer to 12 plus 3.5 is 20, then if you are asked whether what the answer to the 20 plus 8 is, it should say, you should say 20. If you said that, okay, 12 plus 3.5 was 18, I would expect you to say that the 12 plus 8 is also 18. If you know, or uh, assuming that you answer the 3.5 to be 8. If uh, you said that the uh, 3.5 was 6, I want you to tell me that the 12 plus 6 is 18 and 12 plus 3.5 is also 60. Yeah, something like that, right? Very straightforward thing. And then this makes it, and then you have to, is it really simple? It turned out that they're trying with, again, GPT, I, I had to up update it with the GPT-4. It's actually not always the case. In this case, on the left panel, what I have is that the, let's see, oh, this is too small. Okay, four factorial, and then I ask it, it said 24, good. And then I ask it, four plus four factorial is 28, correct. And I say, okay, four plus 24 is suddenly 48. I'm okay with the incorrect thing. And, and in fact, actually, you know, it's probably just memorizing because four factorial shows up quite a lot. But you know, it got the 24 right. I'm pretty impressed, but then the, I'm very unimpressed by the, the final one, right? So what we did was that we made our simplest possible nested arithmetic expressions almost randomly. Max steps five only, operators are plus minus uh, division and multiplication and up to only three digits. It's very simple. And then what we did was that for each one of these, if there is a parenthesis, and then we always added a parenthesis to avoid any kind of confusion. Parenthesis, we asked the individual parenthesis 
and then get the answer and then try to plug it in and then you ask it. And then what we want is that if we want all these answers to be same. Could be incorrect, we don't really care. Could be incorrect, but same. Like the, you know, the three digit multiplication, you know, of course, I'll be, su I'll be surprised if it doesn't make any mistake. So really relatively straightforward, make our arithmetic equation, uh, you know, expressions, replace some of them with its own answers, and then see if the answers stay the same. Turned out that the, except for GPT-4, in this case I put it, most of the models don't do it. Even the GPT-4 has a less than 50% of the chance that it's going to give you the same answers to all those compositionally consistent, let's say, prompts we made. And then what this tells us is that the language model cannot really tell two equivalent expressions. Now, if the accuracies were really high, we couldn't have actually drawn this conclusion. So the low accuracy saved us because what you see is that if the accuracy is 100%, let's say you have the gigantic table that saves all those arithmetic equations, the answers, of course, you can get it perfectly, but then it doesn't really tell us whether it knows about the equivalence there. But then at the moment, these language models are so bad at the arithmetics, it actually allows us to draw this kind of conclusion. But then, of course, accuracy is going up. But then the consistency is going up actually more slowly. What that means is that the, these language models are getting these uh, questions more correct, but not necessarily for the more correct reasons that we anticipate them to be. And then the, you can actually test this kind of thing very, very easily. You do see all those multilingual language models these days. You go up there and then ChatGPT is large, you know, somewhat multilingual. You go out there, or the Google Bard actually, that's even better. Go out there, if you speak more than one languages, try to mix them in but in a way that preserves the semantics. These models are not going to give you the same answer depending on how you mix them in. And then that's also how you jailbreak a lot of these language models for your you know, like the information. So what this actually tells us is that the, despite these language model successes, which I'm very excited by, and the, the, I'm using these language models quite often, they are not really consistent in a sense that the, they are not answering these questions in a way that we can predict how they are going to answer, which is not that great if you're going to use it for various purposes. And then, you know, of course, we're not, uh, there are many other works along this line. You know, the, some of the work, I think, is from here. Was it from Yuda? Oh, yeah. Yes, the second one, right? Yes. So for instance, one of the, my favorite papers from last year is the UL 2023 on you know, checking the GPT-4's performance and then the sensitivity to representation. And then one of the experiments they did was the very simple arithmetics. But then in default setup, it works perfectly. But then as soon as you ask in a base nine, the accuracy drops dramatically because it doesn't really have the same kind of, let's say, representation of the number or that it doesn't know how to map the two different representations of the same number in the system. So yeah, I mean, the, it looks like you know, the, there are many evidence, uh, pieces of evidence that tell us that the okay, language models are accurate, but in many cases for the wrong reasons. Now that doesn't mean that the language models are not bad, right? But if they are accurate, then they are still very, very useful. But at the same time, to go further, I think there is something that we need to fix. And unfortunately, I don't really have any suggestions on how to fix it. But one suggestion I have, uh, one thing that I'm doing is to looking at a bit of a, you know, machine learning has been really successful with the maximum likelihood estimation that is essentially the counting how often things appear together. But then can we actually go beyond that by you know, the borrowing some ideas from different areas like the active learning or the causal inference? So far, what I have gotten from the causal inference is that almost everything is impossible. So I don't know how much we can actually act on that one, but that's the directions that I'm looking into. Now, before I move on to the second part, I need to actually uh, make a one warning is that, okay, OpenAI doesn't reveal anything about the training models and deployment. And in particular, I think the deployment is the biggest issue. So data, they can tell us whatever they want. Algorithms, probably you know, using something that we can guess, but the deployment time, they want to do a lot of things, quantization, decoding algorithms, all those if else filters that they can change. So even if they tell you that, okay, this, is, this model is, I don't know, Da Vinci, Instruct, you know, at the 0914, that doesn't actually mean that you're going to get the same answer every time because they're going to change the decoding algorithm setups, if and else setups, all those filtering rules. So in a sense, that the, my guess is that the, including this, this work that I have done, a lot of the papers that we see that are talking about the OpenAI's GPT for what it can do, what it cannot do, is probably all invalid in general. So including my own, so it should be okay, but yes. Uh, but thanks to Omo uh, coming out of the UW, uh, hopefully uh, the, we'll have a more of a chance of looking into what goes on behind all these language models more carefully. 
So I guess I won't be able to cover the third part, but that's the second part. But is there any question on the first part before we continue with the second part? Okay, so second part, second part. Uh, this one was done by the Michael Hu and also Angie as well, together with the Naomi Stafra, who is now at the Kempner Institute at Harvard. So one thing really I already mentioned, but I'm going to repeat it again, is that the optimization should be the first class citizen in this era of the large scale language models or the deep learning. For instance, I read the OMO and then I, so at Genentech, we're actually training our own language models of the seven billion, several tens of billion parameters from scratch ourselves. I can literally tell you that the, we are spending slightly more than how much we are paying the engineers working on that, right? I mean, because the compute is expensive, data processing is expensive and so on. But in many of these so-called machine learning papers, recent machine learning papers, it's almost like you write it and they say that the, this is a training objective, here's an amazing regularizer, boom, done. Adam solved everything, Adam W, I guess these days. Yeah, Adam W, yes, solved everything. But then, of course, uh, that's where the beef is. So let's look at that beef. And then we all have been knowing for some time that the optimization actually matters. If you think about it, space of the model is extremely large. It's going to be in the dimension, uh, it's like the billions, if not tens of billions of dimensional space. In other words, we, there's no way we can exhaustively explore this whole space. And in particular, with the local learning rule like the SGD, a learning trajectory is bound to be highly, highly localized. And then this is uh, one, of the, one piece of the evidence is the low trade ticket hypothesis. What they are saying is that, the, well, starting from where we ended up, we come back, and then we can actually rule out all those dimensions that the optimized, uh, SGD didn't touch upon and then we can actually replay it without worrying about that one. What that means is that the really optimization is what matters. And then the interesting thing is that because the space is so large, we end up with the multiple solutions depending on where we start, what kind of optimizers we use. The question we have to ask now is whether those solutions are equivalent to each other. If you just look at the objective function, they're almost all equivalent. You always get to the very low loss function. In fact, not only the empirical lo uh, training loss, but also the test loss these days. But are they really, really same? And in fact, we've known for some time that they are absolutely not the same. So this is uh, one of my favorite papers from 2018. This paper, I think, was rejected over and over, I heard. It was a paper from one of the workshops from the Nyarnsons group at the Stony Brook. Oh, in fact, Yejin used to be at Stony Brook, yes. And then what they did was a really simple experimentation. They built a sequence model, recurrent net based, and then they built a synthetic data set. And then they created so that the training set has a, followed a particular length distribution. And then they made a bunch of the separate test sets that have a different, let's say, length distribution. And then what you see uh, on the screen is that the top row is a standard. This, this data set doesn't have any noise, so the, it can solve the problem perfectly. But then if you look at the, for all those models, the 50 different models they got, if you, if they tested it on the, let's say, data set that has more repetition, shorter sequences, or the longer sequences, you do see that the, all those 50 models are dramatically different in terms of the accuracy already. And in fact, what is surprising is that there was a one model that worked almost perfectly on the long sequences as well, although it's never seen anything that actually that long. And then in 2020, Gero said, oh, is this also from Seattle? Maybe there are a lot of things that are happening in Seattle, actually. <laughs> wrote a paper, the paper, shortcut learning paper, a bit thicker than necessary, I gotta say. However, there was an amazing figure. I, I love this figure because this is really well drawn and then easy to follow, is that the, well, there are all possible decision rules under, let's say, uh, the, under the universe, and then based on what kind of, let's say, uh, learning algorithm or the models we use, we have uh, rules that are learnable by these you know, models. And then among these things, there are uh, rules that actually solve the training examples perfectly. But then, in fact, the, we get an increasingly smaller subset of the rules that actually can solve the problem in a way that we want it to solve, that actually generalize systematically to the different, uh, systematically so that they can ignore all those superior correlations that exist in the data. Where, okay, so the definition of the superior correlation, we're going to skip over it, but whatever we don't like, we're going to call that call the superior correlation for now. And indeed, uh, this, is, this has been a, one of the major theme in natural language processing over the past, let's say, couple of years. For instance, this work this time, this work is from NYU or the 
Hopkins, depending on how you count it, where they actually came up with these kinds of so-called challenge sets. So test sets that are, in fact, correct test sets, but have uh, some different, let's say, uh, statistical or the underlying structures. And then what they saw, show, saw was that the, all those amazing classifiers simply fail. And then you can always create this kind of test set to fail these you know, the classifiers. Although these test sets were created not without reference, without reference to the actual models. So it's not really an adversarial example setup, but more like the distributional shift setup. If we want to talk about the difference between these two, okay, that's another thing. But if, we, if the person who created a data set didn't look at the model directly, we're going to call it distributional shift for now. An unfortunate thing is that essentially we cannot distinguish across these solutions. So people say, oh, we can always come up with a new test set to test it. But that's only if you know what these models are going to fail for. And if you already knew that, essentially there was never a problem. You're going to just fix it yourself. And then that's the challenge of the out of distribution generalization or not, is that the, there's no such thing as out of distribution generalization. I can always get you the uh, impossible case. I want to flip the labels. And then you know, no, nothing can work. So there has to be some kind of assumption, but the assumption has to be there, have to be there without looking at the data or the, anything you know. So it's really difficult. So the question is more like, the, can we find other signals that indicate us that some of the solutions are more preferable than the others. And then one thing that we looked at was the optimization trajectories. The reason is because the learning is not really a homogeneous phenomenon. You know, you don't see the loss going down you know, one step at a time. It actually is a very weird phenomenon. And then you know, this is a work by my postdoc in 2020 that shows that the, if we look at the test loss, these two optimization trajectories are exactly the same. But if we look at uh, training loss, they are exactly the same. But if we look at the test loss, eventually they are very different. So how do we actually distinguish the, between these two? It turned out that they're looking at the uh, spectral radius of the covariance matrix, actually. The Fisher information matrix turned out to actually distinguish them very cleanly. And then, but after some point, until some point, it, we couldn't tell. And then we called it break-even point. And then this is another work by my former postdoc, Chaehyung. And then here, what we show is that the, so what happens if the SGD converges? What does that mean? Of course, gradient never goes to zero. It's stochastic gradient descent. So what that means is the own expectation is going to go to zero. But then what we see is that the most of the stochastic gradient we compute have a similar norm, almost always. So then that means that the, you know, the spread in angle has to go up. And then what we saw was that the, when the spread is higher, they tend to generalize better. Very empirical, and then we do have this. This one is super theoretical because the Chaehyung is a math PhD. But at the end of the day, empirical results tells us so. And then, furthermore, optimization trajectory is not really monotonic. It's like the some, some, some. Sometimes it looks like you know, it's actually getting worse, and then it gets better. That's really weird. In fact, we saw that quite a lot of time early on, like 2013, 14, in particular in Montreal, because we're just, you know, we're cowboys just training this model and that model. And then what Charles Gouser, who is now at EPFL, showed was that, the, well, for this particular weird type of the problem, somehow the, both the training and test objective stays exactly flat forever, and then it looks like the test loss gets worse. But then at some point, suddenly they drop, and then the training loss continues, but the test loss has a, a, some plateaus, but then it drops again. And then in 2015, this is not from any paper, but this was a, from a talk by the Phil Blunsom at the CIFAR D Deep Learning Summer School. What he showed was that the, oh, when we train this attention-based question answering model, looking at the validation accuracy is flat for about five epochs, and then it just jumps. Meanwhile, the test accuracies are always just going up. So, you know, the, these days, what do you call it? I guess you call it grokking or whatnot, right? But we've all known this for so long, yes. And then, of course, you know, there is an issue of the double descent as well. And then we, it's really difficult to see the double descent in practice. But you know, sometimes you can artificially create the situation to look at that. And then you know, the grokking now, you all know. So then the question is, that, OK, so if this all seems like some kind of breadcrumbs, so can we actually pick it up? And obviously, I'm, you know, I'm not the only one. We're not the only one. But there is a one major issue here. It's that it's so high dimensional. We cannot really do much about it. Although, you know, at the, uh, it turned out that there was a one solution that is kind of impossible for many of us. Is that the, if I were Jeff Hinton, I could imagine the three-dimensional trajectory of the loss. 
and then just shout out at the 7 billion, then you might think maybe you might think I could get it. But unfortunately, this kind of, let's say, thinking about the high dimensional space and how things happen is kind of impossible for us to get the grasp of. I know. Unfortunately, right? Yes. Well, these days, I don't know. I'm much more optimistic than Jeff, I guess. But OK. Um, so we thought, OK, so if we don't know how to analyze these high dimensional optimization trajectories, what can we do? Let's use machine learning. Why do we start working on machine learning or the statistics or whatnot? It is to analyze data that is often in a form that is difficult for us to grasp the sense of. So we're going to use it. And then you know, we, my students were talking about, you know, oh, this optimization, we need to look at this number, that number. And I was like, well, I don't know. Which, how do you know which one number is the right number? And I was like, oh, can we do something? And I was like, can we actually try to analyze it using machine learning? And then they're like, oh, what can we do? How about hidden Markov models? And then I don't know how it is in this department. Not a lot of places actually teach hidden Markov models anymore. Me included. I, mean, I haven't really taught the hidden Markov model for the last time I taught was about seven years ago, actually. So hidden Markov model is a very simple, one of the first uh, machine learning model that you learn when you learn the sequence modeling. And then the idea is that the generative story is such that the, there are some discrete latent space, and then this discrete latent space uh, states, and then these states evolve following a Markov process. And then at each time, once you this, uh, transition happens, there's an emission distribution that actually produces the actual observation. And then once you have that one, what you can do is, given some sequence trajectory, you can try to infer what is the corresponding sequence of the states that maximizes a posterior distribution over the sequences. Or you, you know, there are many different ways to do that. So we decided to do that. We're going to train these models a lot and a lot. We're going to save all those checkpoints and then extract the features. We're going to do the manual feature extraction. Who knew that I was going to do that? But we're going to do that. And then we're going to fit the HMM using the bound Welsh algorithm. And then we're going to use the forward and backward algorithm to figure out the most likely sequence of states. And then we're not going to use the loss values themselves because what we want to know is that the, is there a breadcrumb that we can actually pick up that is beyond just looking at the loss values. So these are some of the features. We just collected all the things that everyone told us or the uh, people have been looking at as an important values for the optimization. But everyone had to look at only one at a time or just how one affects the entire trajectory. But here, what we're going to do is say, well, let's see how things change over time. So once you fit the HMM and then run the posterior inference, you get a transition matrix that tells us how the states actually change over the optimization. And then second thing is that, okay, what are the important features for the change in the state? So for an example, we train a ResNet 18 without batch norm nor the residual connection. I'll tell you why. On CIFAR 100, bunch of times, a lot of times, and then we fit the HMM. And then here are two trajectories. What you see is that the, it actually learned to extract the five states. So we did uh, all those cross validations and so on to find the optimal number of the states. And then the training run on top goes through the bottom line. Okay, so this is too small. Okay, starting from the three, go to two, zero, and then four. But the bottom one, which actually had a long plateau at the beginning, starts from three, and then it goes to one, and then zero. So what it actually gives us is, the, okay, so one state that we want our optimization algorithm to go to is the two, as opposed to one. So it really gives us a kind of powerful example. And then we decided to try it on a grokking. Is grokking real? And then if the grokking, can this HMM figure out the different kind of grokking state here and there? So we follow the, exactly the recipe that is known, training a one layer transformer on modular addition. X plus Y mode 113. I don't know how they came up with it, but we just followed the recipe. It turned out that the, what they showed as a dramatic rocking doesn't necessarily happen always. If you train it over and over from a different initialization, sometimes it shows, sometimes it doesn't. And then by fitting the HMM, we actually could identify like precisely which state is the one that you know, we would call it uh, the undesirable state where nothing really happens. And then what is the state at which the training loss is bottom and then suddenly the validation loss follows through. 
And then you know, based on that, we could actually tell that the, some of these features that we looked into, such as the sparsity and whatnot, is one of the important, let's say, driver of how these states change. And then you know, at the, how do we actually know, how do we, and then you know, at the, of course, we want to do even more machine learning. How do we know which states are actually desirable? We're going to feed a linear regressor that's going to take us the input back of states to the final generalization accuracy. And then we look at the coefficients. So we're essentially using all the machine learning one-on-one, -on -one. second week thing, HMM, linear regression. And then what it showed was that, okay, we can find so-called two tour states very easily. So we're doing machine learning on top of machine learning on top of machine learning. And I like this, yes. So interesting thing. So then the tour states, now we know that, okay, there are breast crumbs. Can we actually do something about it? It turned out that the, really the hyperparameters are the most important thing in deep learning because depending on what, how we choose them, optimization problem just dramatically changes and we can literally see them with this approach. So original ResNet actually doesn't have that kind of erratic behavior. Optimization almost always work like beautifully, regardless of how you initialize them. And then that's what you see on the top of the right panel. There is a like, the linear chain of the states that the learning goes through. But as soon as we remove the batch normalization and the residual connections, you do see all those erratic behaviors. And then you know, this makes sense. How did we get here? We learned we learned a few things only along the way. One is, okay, residual connections or the shortcut connections are amazing because it actually addresses the vanishing gradient. And then we know that there's some kind of normalization somehow magically, you know, make the uh, problem better conditioned. And of course, there's a tension that I love, of course, but well, it was all just a fit for network in this particular case. And as soon as we remove them, of course, the optimization starts working like crazy. And then the funny thing is that the, one of the setup that Nandial used, there was a one layer transformer on the modular, what was it, like the addition, uh, mo modulated addition. If you read the paper really, really carefully, they don't have layer normalization. They took it out, and then they use an extremely large mini batch. And then in fact, uh, uh, Jan LeCun in his paper from the, on the tips and tricks of the efficient backdrop, he actually tell, tells us that they use small mini batch. Online is the best one, but it's computationally inefficient. So we're like, okay, let's add back the uh, layer num. Let's add back the, uh, decrease the batch size. And then those two tour states all disappeared. So this really tells us that we have to be careful about analysis in a sense that the, there, we could run into an issue of the doing analysis for the purpose of the sake of the analysis when a lot of the analysis, the things that we analyze may just disappear very easily. Yeah, so I mean, we don't see it, just everything goes down pretty nicely actually from there on. So what we did here was to use the hidden Markov model to detect various phases of learning, and then using a linear regression to figure out what are the states that we don't really like. So we're trying to pick up the breadcrumbs and then trying to figure out, okay, what is the parts that we don't want to go to? And then in other words, because we work on machine learning, we have to be, we, we shouldn't be shy about using machine learning to analyze our own, let's say, research topic as well. Now, there are a couple of the next steps that we are looking into. Turned out to be way more difficult than they, what we have done so far. One is a filtering instead of a smoothing. So we are looking at the entire trajectory over and over, and then you are doing the smoothing, that is that they're doing the maximum maple tree on the entire full trajectory of the state. But of course, that doesn't help because training is already over. Can we actually do it in a filtering mode on the fly? And then second thing is you know, going into more of a causality instead of the correlation in a sense that they, just like in a common filtering sense, can we actually learn to intervene on various components within the neural net in order to make the optimization work even better or to go to the desirable solution state? So that's the end of part two. And then you know, Yejin told me to stop at 4.30. I'm going to spend the next two minutes talking about the part three really fast. Okay. So this is a uh, figure from the blog post by the Ferran Huzar who is now at Oxford, if I recall correctly, or on the uh, Cambridge. And then the funny thing is that the data alone is ambiguous. Everyone knows about it, everyone talks about it, teaches about it, learns about it, but we all forget about it as soon as the class is over. And then we all feel like the, we have transformers and Jensen Wang's you know, the, uh, team of, let's say, GPU engineers, problem solved. But unfortunately, we all know, but it's true that the assumptions actually do matter and that we have been just making assumptions very implicitly or following the assumptions that have been made by the, you know, like the 
tech people as well as the statistical learning theory people a long time ago, and we've been just following it. Not everyone in this room, as far as I can tell, uh, follows that assumption, but that's what we've been implicitly following. And then this is very easy to tell when the data alone is ambiguous, is that the, you can always come up with a different ways in which the data was produced, but if you only have a small, narrow uh, view into the data, then we might actually, and we cannot often distinguish between different, let's say, data generating processes, which matters, especially when the distribution changes. That is, the gener data generating process changes from the training to the test time. If you know what the data generating process is, and if you know what kind of things might change more likely, then we can come up with a better algorithm rather uh, than just looking at the whatever has been given to us. And I'm going to, so the assumption matters, especially for distribution shifts, skipping all these things. So, have you all heard of the multitask learning? Yes, language model is actually a multitask learning. And then the goal here, I'm going to simplify it really a lot. We have two classification tasks, y and y prime, given the x, and then we want to solve both of them in order to solve the main task, y better. And then Rich Caruana, okay, in Seattle, huh? Seattle has something, okay. Actually wrote in his uh, PhD dissertation in 1998, like long section about why this should help, but then if you read it really carefully, you feel you know that this actually magic. It somehow has to help, and Rich shows a lot of examples, but he also doesn't know why it worked. And then we're always like, okay, can we actually build a working multitask learning from scratch, at least for a very narrow setup? Yeah. Why don't you buy Rich's explanation? There are many explanations, but. I couldn't actually understand exactly how that connects to Rich's algorithms. It's, it's, so the, I, I actually have another slide uh, somewhere in the back that talks about it. Something like the, one of the reasons he gives out is the eavesdropping. And I was like, I don't get it. Eavesdropping of the one test on another. And I was like, what does that actually mean? It's very, it's somewhat half philosophical. I think that's the reason there. But, we're going to actually make it a bit more concrete. And then we're going to say that the, this is a work by the, my PhD student, Taro Makino. So what is the setup under which multitask learning has to work? So we're setting the, setting the problem here is that the, we have the main task, y and y prime. And then given that, we are saying that the XR observation is generated. But what we're going to do is we're going to say that the, there is a unobserved confounder that causes both a y and y prime. But we don't observe this. And then if I just solve the single task learner by using just y, what happens is that the, there is a superior backdoor path that opens between y and x that is not the direct connection from the y to x, but that is via u, y prime, and x. And then what this means is that if we train a classifier to go uh, learn the correlation between y and x, it's going to learn it very well. But if the distribution over u changes in the test time, the classifier is going to fail because the half of this correlation, this superior correlation, will in fact change, even though the direct connection doesn't change. If we do the multitask learning in this particular case by looking at the y and y prime, of course, observing the y prime cuts off this open path, open backdoor path, and then that allows us to, in fact, make a classifier that is invariant to the distribu prior distribution over this u, that is a target causing confounder. One thing that tells us is that yes, we can train this model, but when we test the model, we should actually predict y and y prime jointly. And then we're trying to subtract out this superior relationship that exists because of the y. And then this is slightly different from the usual practice of multitask learning where we, once we train a model, we throw away everything that we don't care about and then we only keep the main task. But in this case, what it tells us is that if we wanna build a robust classifier that benefits from the multitask setup, we should actually look at all of them together and then adjust in the post hoc sense, you know, how they are related to each other. And then the adjustment can be done either data driven way or in a heuristic driven way. So does it actually help? Yes, it actually does help in this particular situation where the distribution shift happens. And then this kind of distribution shift, you can think about so many examples. Let's say you know, you're doing a multitask learning of the, what kind of clothes the person is wearing, uh, what kind of, let's say, uh, shirts the person is wearing, what kind of pants they're wearing, and then there's a weather that is, you know, the unobserved confounder there. So this kind of thing happens. So what I, I wanted to say that, okay, assumptions really do matter. So when you solve a problem, you gotta think about the problem first, and then assumption first, that you went into a data collection as well as a problem that we're solving. So looking forward, 
one thing that I think is really exciting or interesting is to look at all those various paradigms in machine learning that we are using every day, although we haven't really figured out why some of them had to work. And then I think that we can actually give some examples or the setups where they have to work or you know, the, where they shouldn't work as well. And then doing so, we can actually rely, uh, you know, like rely quite a lot on this kind of, a, say, graphical models as well as a causal uh, analysis or the causal representation learning. And then this is also interesting. Bernard has been saying this ever since like 2012. And then you know, I don't know, it's been 12 years and I'm finally getting what he actually said in 2012. Just like you know, what Leon said in 2015 and 1997. So uh, this is the end of the part two. Just to, I'm going to wrap it up. Conclusion of the part two of the Leon's talk was that the tra training testing only goes so far. And then we probably have already hit the, you know, at the limit. In 2015, we kind of, let's say, forgot to hear it out. And then you know, the, to fulfill our increased ambition, it was 2015, big data was still the term that everyone was using, but big data and artificial intelligence. We have to probably go beyond it. And then you know, the, I think that there are a few things that we kind of, let's say, didn't think about it too much, and then just you know, like they put it into the closet. Probably time to look at all those things that we uh, hid in the closet. And then this ends the talk. <laughs> Thank you. We have uh, maybe uh, a few minutes for QA. Um, yeah. I, I will shoot one question. Um, how do you know for sure if a groking is not coming when you didn't see groking, especially? Um, can you get some insights about that based on your HMM-based uh, analysis? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, even without HMM, uh, groking seems to be just an incorrect hyperparameter search. Yeah. Not enough hyperparameter search. So do you think it's always coming? It's just that we are stuck in some unfortunate situation, but you wait long enough, it's going to come versus? Uh -huh. so, so my guess is that the, if we wait enough with a stochastic gradient descent and this kind of non-parametric setup, wait enough, it's eventually going to find something reasonable. Getting out of this, you know, probably long plateau somewhere. But then, of course, that eventually could be exponential, you know, in terms of the dimension. But then you know, this dimension is so large. But then my guess is that the, we can always do much better given any time constraints by doing a better hyperparameter search. And then this is actually from the attention-based QA model, 2015, did mine work? No one sits there with the attention anymore because we found a better hyperparameter than initialization. <laughs> Any and also, question? we are not using RMS Pro, I guess. Yes. I have a question. In this talk, you gave a lot of examples uh, where you're trying to you know, validate the accuracy of the models. And uh, there's concrete answers, like true or false, is something correct, right? Is uh, summarization correct or something? Um, what about the fact that these large language models are being used you know, sometimes for work that needs accuracy, but also sometimes for work that people expect the unexpected, like for entertainment or brainstorming? Like, How, how do you think this is going to play out in the future? Yeah, that's actually a very exciting aspect of these language models. And then people talk about hallucination as something that it needs to be addressed. I'm like, why? That's the best part of the language models at the end of the day. Because what we want is, so we're testing all these language models on the things that we know the answers to, or we can actually figure out the answers to ourselves eventually. And I think that's just a baby step we're taking. The real step that we're going to take with these language models is when we use the language models to solve a problem that we wouldn't even have dreamed of solving. And then, you know, hallucination helps because hallucination is only hallucination if we know that that's incorrect. But in many cases, like the scientific discoveries, molecular discoveries, drug discovery, and whatnot, these are the things that actually help us expand our creativity and horizon. Now, of course, verification is important. We're going to verify it in labs, clinical trials, and the actual experimentations. But that's where we are going. So in that sense, I don't know. I'm not too worried about language models. I'm, I'm worried that it's, too, it's not good enough. You know, we want it to be even better. Yeah. Thank you. So summarizing a lot of things, including part one of your talk, uh, there's a lot of things that language, large language models aren't good for. Reasoning, planning, even arithmetic, and things like that. And we shouldn't be surprised because they're language models, right? So I think the question is, well, how about if, you know, when we want to you know, to make an analogy, right? If we want to, you know, uh, turn a screw, we need a screwdriver, and an LLM is a hammer, 
So what about, you know, why aren't we researching screwdrivers? Do you have any ideas on good screwdrivers? Mm -hmm. I see. So I don't think LLM is a hammer. LLM, uh, or the, this kind of large-scale language model, what I see is that the, it's a very uh, fluid or the malleable kind of hammer to the point that the, given any kind of constraints that we can express in terms of the you know, good enough quality data, is we can always kind of you know, like the reshape it so that it's going to be like screw. It's not going to be as good as the screw screw that will, can only do the screwing, but this can do the screwing, with more data, we can actually make it to something else or become a hammer and so on. So in a sense that I think this is actually where we, we should view this kind of language model as can, is a programming language that where we can actually put the constraint on computational time. So what if the ON is the max we can do? And then we bring in all those data as a constraint, we had, get it, and then on average it's going to do well on the ON time kind of thing. So maybe it's not hammer, it's a hammer with a screw as well. Yes. Thank you for the talk today. I was wondering, under the part where you're talking about your multitask generative um, model, where you had like U and Y and Y prime and X, I was wondering your opinion on: Do you think there it's possible to find a generally a set of tasks that are generally a better multitask set, like families of tasks that would, in general, regardless of what downstream task you're evaluating? Do you think that model will be able to lead to a better set of tasks, or do you think it might be dependent on the specific eva evaluation task like X that you were evaluating upon? Yeah, um, so I'm at the, I, let me answer it from two different angles. One is that the, if our goal is to find the minimal set of the task, based off of which we can use a multitask learning to solve one task really, really well, and then the focus is on minimal set of tasks, then you know, we have to think about the problem set of you know, how these tasks are related to each other. And then one set of that I just showed is that where the marginal distribution over the labels are related to each other. But in reality, in practice, in my, uh, the success of the large models, what it tells us is that the, what these large language models are going to do is, is a, is a non-parametric learner with essentially the infinite amount of the capacity in terms of the storage. Mm -hmm. So what it does is that it's going to learn a lot of different learners. Some are going to combine few tasks, some are not, and then among them, some are going to be selected. Now the issue is that we don't know exactly which ones are being selected for which problems, thereby we lose the controllability there, but otherwise it's learning it. So if I was building a product now, I don't care, I'm going to put everything and then see what happens. But if you are thinking about, okay, what is like the right setup under which things ha happen in a way that we anticipate and using that to make it so that they inc increase the controllability of these systems, then I think uh, the thinking about this kind of assumptions matter. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's wrap up here and thank the speaker, Thomas, again. Thank you.